and the astronomers weigh in on this, and they look at this late heavy bombardment, which peaked 3.85 billion years ago, and they calculate it would take 50 million years for the planet to cool enough that rocks can form and liquid water uh, could begin to uh, precipitate out on the surface of the Earth. Well, you can do the math. Take 3.85 billion years, subtract 50 million years from it, what do you get? 3.80. And yet we have evidence that life has been abundant as far back as 3.80. Subtract 3.80 from 3.80, that gives you no time for the origin of life. And that same carbon-12 to carbon-13 analysis tells us that planet Earth, over its entire 4.5662 billion year history, has never had prebiotics. Prebiotics would have a higher ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12. All the carbonaceous material we see in the entire record, the geological record of the Earth, has a signature of being postbiotic, not prebiotic which means planet Earth never had a primordial soup, and the origin of life on planet Earth took place in a geologic instant. Well, there is no time for the origin of life, and there is no soup from which to assemble uh, that life, then that really does rule out a naturalistic explanation for the origin of life on planet Earth. Now, if you were to go to a chemist and say, well, let's just talk about these Prebiotics. Let's just assume they exist in some way. What would be the first step or the simplest step in taking those prebiotic molecules and putting them together to make a living system? Well, a requirement of living systems is that all the amino acids that make up the proteins and all the sugars that make up the backbone of the RNA and DNA molecules must be homochiral, which means they all must have the same orientation. Amino acids come in two types, left-handed oriented and right-hand oriented. Likewise, the nucleotide sugars have the same feature, a left-handed uh, configuration and a right-handed configuration. Now, life here on planet Earth, the amino acids are all left-handed and the nucleotide sugars are all right-handed. You say, what happens if you mix it up? then the amino acids won't assemble and the nucleotides won't assemble and you won't have proteins, DNA, and RNA. Well, it was a number of years ago that the biochemist William Bonner made this comment after 25 years of trying to research the source of homochirality on planet Earth. And he concluded after 25 years of research that, quote, terrestrial explanations are impotent or non-viable. There's simply nowhere on the planet Earth, in the entire history of planet Earth, where there could be any chemical or physical mechanism that could explain how all amino acids that make up life could be put into a left-handed configuration and the sugars into a right-handed configuration. And what this did is it fostered a search to find the sources of homochirality in outer space. And indeed, what we astronomers note is when you go into outer space, there are places where you get circularly polarized ultraviolet light that has the effect of destroying one of the handedness of the molecules and leaving the other handedness uh, less destroyed. And so it preferentially destroys, say, left-handed amino acids and preserves the right-handed, or it could do the reverse. The problem, however, is that it takes 100% circularly polarized ultraviolet light just to get 20% excess of one-handedness against the other. And for light to be possible, it must be 100%, not just 20%. Uh, moreover, when we look in the uh, universe, we only find two places where you can get this circularly polarized ultraviolet light, and that's in the immediate vicinity of black holes and neutron stars. But in no case do we see a place where there's 100% ultraviolet uh, circularly polarized light. And therefore, the best that we can simulate under laboratory conditions that model these black holes and neutron stars is that you would get an excess of 1.12%, which is woefully inadequate uh, to solve the homochiral uh, problem. Uh, moreover, it would all have, to be wave, uh, all have to be ultraviolet light at just a single wavelength, and no astrophysical source has that. 
So we're left without any terrestrial source, and we're also left without any astronomical source in which we can possibly solve this homochorality problem. Now, this explains this new discipline of astrobiology. Uh, basically, origin of life researchers trying to explain the origin of life from a naturalistic perspective have given up on planet Earth. They say Earth is not a possible source. Life must have come to planet Earth from outer space. And we don't know how to solve the homochiral problem on outer space. We're simply not going to worry about it. That's what I find amazing. Here are these scientists have been working for 40, 50 years to solve the homochiral problem. They basically proved that it's impossible to solve from a naturalistic perspective. And so what happened? Research simply halted on trying to find a way around this problem. However, there is furious research going on on trying to see if they can find amino acids and uh, these nucleotide sugars in outer space. Now, the one location, and really the only location in astrophysics where there's any possibility for the chemistry that would make amino acids and these nucleobases are these dense interstellar gas clouds that exist throughout our galaxy and in other galaxies that we see around us. Uh, but there's a problem. Uh, these interstellar molecular clouds, even though they're filled with over 120 carbonaceous molecules of different types, we don't see any water there and we don't see any ammonia. Without ammonia and without water, you're not going to have a chemical pathway uh, to make the sugars, the nucleobases, or the amino acids. And indeed, as astronomers have searched these interstellar molecular clouds in the attempt to find these amino acids, nucleobases, and sugars, they're coming up with absolutely nothing. Now, I say that because five years ago, there were papers published where certain astronomers claimed that they had found an extremely low abundance level of amino acids and one of the nucleobases. Uh, but in the last year in the Astrophysical Journal, both of those claims have been withdrawn as being mistaken identifications of the spectral lines. And so today it stands that uh, we have zero evidence for these building blocks of life existing anywhere uh, in the entire universe. Now, it wouldn't concern me if in the future they do find, say, amino acids in these interstellar clouds at one part per billion or ten parts per billion. I think the chemistry in those systems might permit the production of amino acids at those extremely low levels. But of course, that's going to be no help uh, for the building of life systems. If the abundance level is below parts per million, there is no possibility uh, for a chemical pathway to pull these things into more complex structures. Well, again, this hasn't bothered the uh, origin of life researchers from the naturalistic perspective. They just say, well, let's just assume it happens somewhere in a galaxy far, far away. And now they've looked at the problem of, if we do presume that this life is out there, is there a way it could be moved through interstellar space and land here on planet Earth? And uh, Fred Hoyle and uh, Chandra Wickramasinghe speculated years ago that maybe bacteria could be embedded in dust particles and those dust particles transported by light pressure uh, to planet Earth. However, astronomers now know that as this dust travels through interstellar space, it's going to be exposed to X-ray radiation and ultraviolet radiation. And it takes only a short exposure time uh, before the bacteria embedded in those dust grains uh, will be completely destroyed by the X-rays and the ultraviolet radiation. That would equally apply to, say, uh, bits and pieces of DNA, RNA, and the proteins. They, too, would be broken down in a short period of time. And what do you mean by short period of time? I'm talking hours, days, at most weeks. And yet the transport time to move these interstellar dust particles from another star system uh, to our solar system is in the millions of years minimum. And during that long transport time, it's guaranteed that the radiation in outer space uh, will destroy the molecules. And there's also the problem that as they enter the Earth's atmosphere, they'll be heated up as they go through the Earth's atmosphere. The dust will be heated up, and that too would destroy any life that would be there. Now, this is a problem that was recognized at the last two Origin of Life research conferences, and astronomers there said, well, dust isn't going to work. Uh, what we need to do is find some vehicle to protect this life. And the vehicle that they came up with was 
a gigantic rock, a rock with a minimum size of two meters in diameter. And if you've got a bacteria square in the middle of that two meter diameter rock, and if the rock is solid rather than being porous, there's a possibility it could be transported across interstellar space, get through the atmosphere, and uh, have that bacteria intact, providing the rock breaks up as it hits the Earth and the bacteria is able to wiggle out.